This is CFRU Operators Video Seminar number one. Today we're going to talk about microphones, microphone usages, and a number of examples of microphones that Radio Griffin has and mics you'll see on campus and in the news media. For our purposes, let's define three basic microphone types, an omnidirectional, a cardioid, and a unidirectional. Microphone technology is such that you could go to a microphone manufacturer and tell them what you want and they can build it for you. You often see performers holding microphones very close up to their mouth like this. The microphone has been built for them so that it picks up only what they sing and within about three inches from that microphone it's dead. So microphone technology is, is quite precise these days. But for our purposes let's talk about omnis, cardioids, and unidirectionals. Omnis, or omnidirectional microphones, pick up in a spherical pattern. They pick up from top, below, sides, and all around. So if you're pointing a microphone at someone, you can also be picked up behind the microphone and people on the side. Cardioid is named after the shape of a heart, and it picks up at the front and at the side, so something like that. It is not supposed to pick up from behind, although depending on the quality of your microphone you may or may not get some leakage at the back. Unidirectionals, let's say things like shotgun microphones, where it's a very fine line, goes straight out and you're aiming at one person, so that's very common in uh, say football games, where the person is high up on the balcony and he points the shotgun mic at one player on the field, and then the microphone picks up in a straight line right down. There's nothing to the side, nothing behind. And there are various combinations of these. There are advantages and disadvantages to every kind of microphone that you use. Um, you gain some advantages when you choose a certain mic and you lose some disadvantages. An omnidirectional picks up in a spherical pattern, as I've said. Now, a disadvantage may be that it picks up from behind so that if you're trying to get something on stage and you use an omnidirectional microphone you're also going to pick up the audience or maybe the band or something like that. A cardioid, because it has that heart shaped, you could use it on stage and it'll pick up the stage and, and some of the side action and in theory anyways it should not pick up from behind, it should not pick up the audience. If you're willing to sacrifice the problem of being picked up from behind, you can gain a number of advantages using the omnidirectional microphone. For example, the omnidirectional microphone is not as subject to popping of P's and hissing of S's as our cardioid microphones. You can handle an omnidirectional microphone a lot more than a cardioid, and noise will not be passed up through the shaft of the microphone and into the mic and reproduced as much as it would on a cardioid. And also another problem with cardioids is called the proximity effect. The closer you move to a cardioid microphone, the more treble you, you lose or the more bass you gain. So there's a change in the frequency that the microphone reproduces depending on how close you are to the microphone. Now as I said, you can use these to your advantage or your disadvantage. If you don't want the thing from uh, picking up from behind and you're willing to sacrifice P's and S's, then you use a microphone. But if you're in doubt, perhaps you're going out on an interview and you don't know what this guy speaks like, perhaps you know, he may have a lisp or he may pop his P's. And it doesn't matter to you that you pick up noise from the side, you're doing an in-street interview or something like that, then an omnidirectional would be best. And I think a basic rule of thumb would be, when in doubt, try first an omnidirectional. Because you don't have as much of a problem with the proximity effect, you don't have as much of a problem with handling the microphone, and uh, you don't have as much of a problem with P's and S's. And this could be important, why, when you're interviewing someone that you, you don't know how he's, he talks. Examples that these microphones are used for. 
This is an omnidirectional microphone. You can't tell by it, its shape. You just have to know the manufacturer makes this. It's 635A. It's made by Electric Voice. This is a very common microphone. It's a workhorse of the industry. Uh, I suppose you could use it for a hammer if you need to. Next time you're watching a newscast on TV or looking through a news magazine, look for this microphone. If there's a fistful of mics being shoved in a politician's face, I'd lay odds that you'll find one of these microphones. Now, for example, we have a picture of Don Jameson being interviewed when he was seeking the premiership of Newfoundland. And you'll find, right here, one of our 635A Omnis. And the interviewee has chosen the 635A because he's not sure of the situation. Perhaps he's going to try and catch a question that one of the other reporters is going to make, so he's going to have to whip his microphone way over and then whip it back to try and get Jameson, or maybe he's just going to sit there and pick up questions all over, and he's going to use the omnidirectional. Perhaps he's unsure of how Jameson is going to speak, and he doesn't want to have popping P's or hissing S's, so he wants an omni. Or perhaps he is going to move the microphone around and is conscious of noise caused by moving the mic because you've got a cable dangling on here, so he's chosen an omnidirectional. And again, when in doubt, try an omnidirectional. This is a cardioid microphone. It's an AKG D190ES. You find a lot of these on campus. They're very popular now. now as I said, if you're speaking in like this, presumably you shouldn't get anything from behind. It should be just picked up at the front like that. But using a cardioid, you gain a proximity effect, a little bass if you move closer. It's subject to handling noise if you're moving this around, and it's more subject to popping P's and S's. Well, let's talk about some situations other than the reporter that we discussed. Let's say you're recording a stage production. You don't want any audience noise. Um, you've got them lined up on the front. I think your first choice would be a cardioid because you don't want the audience, but you want the action on the stage. And you're going to be distant enough from the actors that they won't be popping P's or hissing S's or the proximity effect won't be there. And presumably no one's going to kick the microphone or, or move it around, so you shouldn't have any handling noise. But let's suppose for at least one of these microphones, you also need it to pick up the band, which is behind the mic. In that case, you would use an omnidirectional. You would pick up the stage and the band at the same time. And if you're in the balcony and you wanted to pick up one player and follow that person around, but you didn't want anything else, in that case, you'd have to use a shotgun microphone or a unidirectional. If you're doing studio work and you have an announcer that has a problem with P's or S's, then you'd have to not give him a cardioid and give that person an omnidirectional. And let's say you have a female announcer who's very conscious of her high-pitched voice and would like to gain a little more bass or lose a little more treble. In that case, she can use the proximity effect to her advantage and move closer to the microphone and gain a little bass. So you have choices, and depending on which advantage you wish, you must also realize there are certain disadvantages that you will gain. Before we move on, I also want to show you that microphones are connected to pieces of equipment in several different ways. And if you're going out on location, you have to realize that if you're going to take a particular mic, you've also got to take the uh, patch cord that goes along with it. And we'll be talking about patch cords later on in a different seminar. I don't know if you can focus in on this, Jim, but that's and you'll see we've got a couple here. That connection is known as an XLR3 or a Canon. It's a three pin. It's very common. And most studio microphones are that way. And in order to use that, then you need an appropriate cable of XLR3. But look at this one. This is a microphone for a portable cassette used for interviewing, and it has one of these. That's a Sony mini pin. And that's considerably different than this XLR3. 
But luckily enough, it's all attached, so you're not going to make that mistake. A third example of a different one is this one here. This is also for a portable machine, but it's got... That's a quarter inch. Now, compare it to the, the Sony Mini, you'll see that there's a difference. And again, you've got to be aware that uh, you can't take this microphone out to try and fit into the machine that this one belongs to. And finally, a German microphone. Now, the Germans are fanatics about prestige and doing everything in compact forms. They've got one of these things. You notice it's got uh, one, two, five pins. Hang on there. Five pins. Mm -hmm. And that's, they've got a remote start stop in there and they've got signals and all sorts of, of things. Okay. A portable interview, since we're dealing with uh, portable microphones, there are a number of ways you, you can approach an interview. And let's again be aware of the problems of moving a microphone around if you've got a cardioid. And I think you'll find that a lot of portable tape machine microphones that are given you are cardioids. Well, first thing you could do is you could sit the microphone in between yourself and your interviewee. And you could get a good sound reading and you just talk and don't move the mic. Hopefully, your interviewee will stay put, and presumably you will as well. But at this distance, given the normal space between people, this could sound a bit hollow. Um, you could pick up noise from, from the crowd, so this may not be a satisfactory response. You could move the microphone around. Your question here is answer. Your question is answer. But you're probably going to get noise moving the mic around. And as long as you're aware of that, you can plan for it and edit it out later. But just give yourself time. So move the mic, try and get to his answer, wait, question, answer. This method, though, could be intimidating to your interviewee. So you will have to be aware of that as well. And it may be that this is where you're going to have to sit the mic and just sacrifice a bit of extraneous noise around you. And above all, don't let your interviewee take the microphone from you. Don't lose control of the interview. Don't lose control of your equipment. If he takes the microphone, he could be moving it all around. You could get lots of noise, being assuming that the, your interviewee is not as familiar with the microphones as you are. And we were talking about remote start stops on this microphone. Be aware of remote start stops. You can use them to your advantage. This one's got a, a button right here, and you push it to stop your tape recorder and you release it to start. But it takes time to stop, and it takes time to start up again. So you've got to be aware. As soon as you release this button, count one or two, then ask your question and get your answer. If you release the button and ask your question, it's going to speed up and record you at the same time, and you're going to sound awfully funny when you play it back. And finally, another problem with remote interviewing is an automatic gain control that a lot of portable machines have. If there's nothing there, the machine will go hunting for a sound. And you often hear a whoosh as it hunts, and there's nothing there. And again, just be aware that that, that happens, and later on you can edit it out. In a studio, you've got available several mics relative quiet. So there's a number of things you can do. You can set up the situation in advance. Uh, you try and make the mic inobtrusive and let your guest be at ease. So, for example, you can put the microphone right down here. And eye-to-eye -eye contact, the mic is hardly noticed by your interviewee. Um, you could put it a lot closer if, if your interviewee is not afraid of microphones, but I think a first-time interview it probably would be. So just leave it out of the way. If it's a quiet studio, you shouldn't have any trouble. You can set up a microphone like this on the table, and if you do so, you have to be aware that it, being a cardioid, here is going to be picking up shuffling papers and moving things around. And if you were going to set up a, a boom mic on the table, and a person likes to flip his papers to the right, put the microphone on the left. Don't have them turn papers right in to your microphone. 
And just a side note about interviewing. It sounds pretty bad to hear on the tape. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. This would be very boring. In an interview, you can encourage your interviewee with visual responses by nodding your head. And the audio production is not affected, but you can still encourage your interviewee. And if you're in a studio, it's the same thing for interviewing, if you're in a studio, you can also tell in advance whether or not a person's voice is going to be louder or softer. If he moves back like this, he's moved away from the microphone, and you can expect he's going to be a little softer. Or if he moves up closer, he could get a little louder. Often an automatic gain control is provided by manufacturers of consoles or microphone mixers to cope for people who like to move around like this. But if there isn't one, and you're monitoring the interview, just be aware that if he sets back or forward, that he's probably going to speak louder the next time that he does. And again, the problems of an AJC, automatic gain control, sometimes it hunts for things. And if there's nothing there, you're going to pick up the fan or the buzzing of the fluorescent lights. Finally, I'd like to talk about studio announcing. Now, the microphone is right here. Most times you speak directly into the microphone, giving the microphone about six inches. But if you have a problem with P's or S's, you could talk across the face of the microphone, like that. So that you're not talking directly into the mic, but you're talking across it. But in gaining this advantage of not having your P's and S's, because I mean, the volume of your voice is going across and not into the microphone, you're going to have a problem with papers or things being shuffled down here. You have to be aware that you're creating that situation. And if the microphone's up there, often if you're reading something, you're looking down and you're far distant. And what I prefer to do is to actually have the microphone pointing up like this. So for the most part, I'm talking across the face again, but when I'm looking down to read, I'm also talking into it and I'm not losing volume in that way. Let's review the distinctions between an omni and a cardioid just as we finish. We've got a, a list up there. An omni has a spherical pattern. It has a weak proximity effect. It's less subject to P's and S's. It's less subject to handling noise. And as a general rule, when in doubt, try an omni first. Cardioid, on the other hand, is a heart-shaped pattern, and it's not supposed to pick up anything from behind the microphone. But in gaining that advantage, you also gain the proximity effect. It's subject more to P's and S's. It's subject to handling noise. But if you want to but gain that advantage, again, no if you don't want noise from behind the mic, first choose, first choose a cardioid and omni. And perhaps we can just run down some more mic examples, just popular mics. This again is our omnidirectional cardioid that's on campus a lot. You'll find these in a lot of high school auditoriums. The cardioid, it's uh, good characteristics for your basic public address. And you'll notice that again, it's a, an XLR3 on there. Mm -hmm. But let me just open this up here. On the other end of this thing, it's not an XLR3, but four. So don't take this microphone anywhere with just XLR3s or cannons on it because this needs a four pin. And one of the microphones that Radio Griffin has is a microphone specifically for music. This has a good response in the upper ranges. We use it for acoustic guitar and piano. And just to prove to you that it is a real microphone, we have a picture of Alan Cameron right here. Mm. And there, in fact, is the microphone. Same one that we use. And again, it's an acoustic guitar. That's a 12 string guitar. So it's a real life mic. And one other microphone we have. I'm sure you've seen these before. This is for our sports. On like that. These do not have a, a headphone. This is an omnidirectional microphone, and we found a large 
a large problem in the hockey arena with these. We can't use them because the sound reverberates so much. But in basketball, it seems to be all right. Well, that about wraps it up for microphone usage. Our next seminar is going to be on tape recorders and tape tracks.